All right, everybody. I've got another very special guest for you all. I want everybody to welcome to the show for the first time, Trevor Fernandez Lakevich. Welcome, Trevor. Dude, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. It's great to have you, man. So uh, anyone that doesn't know out there, um, I don't know. I feel kind of like we've come together really quickly here and we have like a sync because Trevor, uh, I think I told you the story when we met in person, but I discovered the Kickstarter for your book, uh, Area 51, right here, everybody, and was all about it and got onto it in the last issue. So I got the whole series right here, right away. And then visited Florida, went to Megacon, and you just happened to be there with us. And mm -hmm. of course, anyone doesn't know, especially for a New Yorker, I know there's Philly stuff everywhere, but I'm a New Yorker. Uh, when you share beer and pizza with somebody, they just immediately become family. And that's what Trevor and I did. And I uh, had a great conversation. And then today, as we're talking, uh, his book shows up in my door. So it's been just, <laughs> we're on sync, man. We're on sync. I love it. It's meant to happen, man. Yeah. So we can get into Area 51 and the new book and all that. But first time being on the show, I got to do it to you. Let's hear the origin story. Where? How did you get to this point? Oh, man. That's a, it's a long one. I, um, I didn't start really reading comics until I was like 16, 17. And I think around 17 was when I became like a, a monthly reader. Um, I was funneled in, in the most peculiar way because the first comic book series that I sat down to read ever was final crisis. Um, wow. <laughs> and it was, it was years after it had come out. And for some reason that had attracted me, uh, Maybe it's the J.G. Jones art, who knows. But I remember getting out of that series and being like, what is going on? You know, uh, like so many questions. And as opposed to being turned off, it just it led me down this rabbit hole. And I found the same name, which is Grant Morrison, attached to the Batman title. And I was a Batman guy. I mean, not in the comic book sense at the time, but I grew up watching the animated series, Batman Beyond, the Justice League cartoon. You know, like Kevin Conroy is my spirit animal, man. And so <clears throat> that just seemed like the logical step. And I I bought all of the floppies. I went on eBay because I, for some reason, the, the un my understanding of graphic novels and trade paperbacks just was not there. So I tracked down the singles, the single issues for Grant Morrison's Batman run on eBay and ran through it. I mean, like devoured it. And I remember going to the comic book store for the first time and being like, where do I go next? And the first thing the guy had mentioned was this little known Batman run uh, called The Court of Owls by Scott Snyder and Greg Capullo. And I bought the first trade, read it three times in one night, went back the next day to buy the second trade, read it another two or three times in one night. And then by the time I went back, I was sorely disappointed to find out that the third trade had not come out yet. So or that it was actually coming out, I should say, in like a week or two, but I could only buy the hardcover. And as a broke 17-year-old, that extra $8 for the hardcover was a real spine breaker. Like I was broke as a joke. And I remember walking out of, uh, I think I went to a Barnes & Noble to pick it up, the hardcover for uh, Death of the Family. And I remember just feeling the emptiness in my pocket, but also having no regrets whatsoever. Um, and by that point I was like, well, I can't wait for the next trade to come out. So I started picking up monthly comics and reading Batman led into Batman and detective and that lead into buying justice league and flash and green lantern. And then it spread to Marvel. And here I am years later and like 70 to 75% of my pull list is all independent stuff. Um, but it, it was a weird journey because when I went to college, I didn't have many friends that liked comics and I sorely wanted to talk about comics with people. And so I started doing reviews and uh, that led to doing interviews. And as I kind of developed my voice as a critic, um, I started getting some more opportunities and I was interviewing some guys that I really admire, like Robert Venditti, Liam Sharp, Brian Hill, Ram V, Pornsack Pichet Choate. Uh, Jonathan Glapian, just uh, Peter Tomasi. I mean, guys, I really, really admire. And, you know, one of the consistent through lines was I was asked quite a bit why I wasn't writing comics because I had, I had studied a lot of the technical elements 
in order to review them because I felt like that's what was missing in the space of the time. A lot of reviewers didn't know how to describe the craft. Um, and so eventually um, came to New York Comic Con in uh, 2019. And I was uh, given like a press seating for the Marvel Fanfare panel where the highlight speakers were C.B. Sabolsky and Chris Claremont. And somewhere towards the end of the panel, for some reason, I thought it would be a good idea to ask uh, the editor-in-chief of Marvel and uh, the face of the X-Men how they reconcile their pure creative intentions with the need to satisfy a large corporate entity that wants to sell toys. And um, they gave me a very, very company man answer. And at, at the end of the panel, uh, CB had approached me as I was kind of walking down the aisle and asked me if I had ever thought about working in comics. And um, the answer was no until the editor in chief of Marvel asked me that question. And um, at the time I was studying molecular biology. So it really felt like it came out of left field. And he um, had given me his card and asked me uh, to apply for an editorial internship, which I did. And I interviewed in March of 2020, the week that hand sanitizer and toilet paper was selling out everywhere. And um, despite getting a call back within a week, um, lockdown happened and that opportunity went away. And um, I was sorely upset for about six months and something finally hit me where um, I, I had realized that I wanted, like with that opportunity so close, all I wanted to do was to try. All I wanted to do was to make comics. And um, to a degree, I, I also wanted to prove that the compliments that were afforded to me by, by CB, by the creators that I admired were valid. And so I took to Kickstarter and uh, by January of 2021, we had the first issue of Area 51, The Helix Project, out. And uh, it's since has it's, it's changed my entire life. Uh, and that's all I want to do. Awesome. That's an awesome story. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess the, the best place to go from there is, uh, I mean, let's talk a little bit about Area 51. I mean, obviously, I discussed how I was... I, ran across this book on Kickstarter at issue six and got uh, pulled in. So what is that book and uh, what's the story there for that one? Yeah. So um, area 51, the Helix project is a six issue sci-fi thriller about a half extra terrestrial boy who's driven to uncover the circumstances surrounding his father's death when he's met with a mysterious uh, letter that puts it all into question. And, He's driven to uncover those circumstances, which sends him spiraling into the jaw of a Cold War genetics conspiracy project deep beneath Area 51. And in order to find his way out with the truth, he's forced to confront a twisted ghost from his past that challenges everything he knows about himself and ultimately what it means to be human. Um, so at the end of the day, despite all of the, the cool workings of genre, uh, it's a very personal story. Uh, it's about identity and reconciling that with memory and with loss. Um, I wrote it at a time where I didn't really know who I was anymore. You know, I thought I was going to have this very safe and secure career, um, in, in, you know, research science. And I, there's a part of me that knew that that wasn't it, you know, that I, I wasn't really happy. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't see a future, you know, I just saw what I thought made the most sense at the time. And, through writing that story over the course of the, you know, six issues, I, uh, I, I really, I think I found who I was, which is incredibly cathartic because I hope I did the same for that character. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's something that I think is, I, I'm, I, let me rephrase that. I think that there was no better I could have done for a first comic book story and I don't think I could have done anything that pure uh, if I were to have done anything else. Yeah. And uh, to my audience out there, I mean, I think he, if you were listening to that description, he hit the keywords as to why it uh, appealed to me, uh, Cold War and sci-fi. And uh, I, I still, you were, you were nice enough to send me digital copies of it. I mean, plus to the Kickstarter, I got them as well, but I am such a, a floppy man that when, 
I got those. I was like, yeah, but I know those physical copies are coming and I want to sit down with the physical copies and read them. So I haven't had a chance to read it yet. I'll just say that up front. But one of the things also like when I'm going through the Kickstarter, not only the description hitting me, I'm like, this sounds like right up my alley, all this stuff. But then I got drawn into the art, which not to uh, say anything negative, but other creators out there, because I, as somebody who has created a comic, I understand that process and why things are done certain ways. But one of the things I noticed was the quality bar set up. It's, it really is a book that I could see being published anywhere. Uh, and we discussed this prior to the recording, but maybe you could jump into that conversation a little bit as to why that was so important to you to have that bar so high. Yeah, man. I mean, I am, um, most of my peers would say that I'm overcritical and that very much extends tenfold to my own work. Um, and when I set out the gate, the goal was, um, as you were so kindly describing it was to create something that looked like it could be on the shelves competing against the biggest names in the industry. Um, not in a monetary sense necessarily, but in a quality sense, you know, I, I, my goal was for somebody to look at that book and never be able to guess that this is the first, not only the first comic I've ever written, but the first thing I've ever written. Um, and so I'm really, really proud of that bar that we were able to not only start with, but raise, you know, I mean, the, that series I think is really special because I feel like the floor was pretty high for, um, especially for a young brand, like a young new creator, but where we were able to take it, I think is something really special. You know, I, I know that there is a, a theme with creatives where, whether it's authentic or not, they tend to be diminu diminutive about that work. But I'm very proud of what we did in those last, those last couple issues in particular. I think we took that story to a level that on a quality standpoint, I would say competes with some of the best work out there in the industry. And that's because I'm working with some of the most talented and unsung creative people um, in comics right now. You know, I mean, we had Samuel Iwunze on on art, who is an absolute artistic, like savant. You know, the guy is brilliant. He's he's intuitive. He, at the end of the day, despite also being uh, an an incredibly technically talented artist, he is a storyteller, and that shows in the work. And then you have Marcio Freddi, who uh, colored him and just brings a vibrancy and life and texture that is 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 unmatched i mean truly i i'm grateful for the entire creative team but to have a colorist that talented that early in my career is probably the biggest flex i could possibly make because the colors can it can in in a big way make or break the art like as as wonderful as sam is i don't think anybody else could have colored him the way that marcio did and and that is like just something I'm incredibly thankful for. And of course, last but not least, we have a name that is ubiquitous in the comic book industry um, who, has, who has worked with every major publisher out there. And that's Taylor Esposito. You know, I, I wanted a veteran letterer, someone who, who, to a degree, whether it was explicit or not, I would be able to learn from and understand uh, how to captain the ship with. You know, uh, that was a huge, huge, huge... Um, stepping stone for me is just working with somebody who knows how it is. Like I bless him, man. I, I, especially early on, I was always like, does, is this working? Am I being, um, I, I really, I wanted to learn from him what it meant to be the captain of the ship because he's worked with so many people in the industry who have made their careers being that. And I was always like, hey, is this right? Like, could I economize the sort of process best this way? And I just, just asking him all these dumb questions. And he was very, very good about it. So um, shout out to the team on that book because um, they are such a huge reason why I feel so damn good about what we were able to do by the end of that series. Yeah. And something you said in there, 
I, I didn't want to cut you off, but colorists to me are like the most unsung hero in comics. Like Great. nobody talks about them and letters fall into this too, but I, I have huge respect for letters too, but they just, they're a notch below what I'm saying here. Colorists are not discussed. They're not mentioned. Nobody pays attention to them. And yet I've seen colorists, if you're really paying attention, take pencil artists that I may be like, eh, on and turn it into a positive. So having one of them that can kind of upgrade the art a little bit, once again, not saying anything negative about your penciler because I, I thought he did a phenomenal job too. But that means so much to any book that and people just do not discuss it. That's I agree, crazy. man. I agree. Colors, colorists deserve way more love. I mean, they are, uh, you know, they're like our cinematographers, man. And if the the film isn't shot with the right light, with the right, uh, with the right palette, um, with the right atmosphere, it's going to change the perception of the story entirely. And like when I was <clears throat> this, like a notch, I will definitely give younger me when I was kind of casting my collaborators on this book. Um, I declined over 30 colorists. Um, and there was a moment where I felt like I was going to have to compromise and, um, go with uh, a collaborator on colors that I, I did, wasn't really in love with. And then luckily Marcio came along and I've never felt more validated in being a uh, uh, quote unquote overcritical in my life <laughs> than right there <laughs> in that moment. Yeah. And just to give letters some love here. Uh, I think the same applies for them, but in terms of being underappreciated, I, the one of the problems letters have in this industry is when a letterer is good, you don't notice it. Mm -hmm. They're meant to blend into the background, but when a letter is bad, it's the first thing you see and it kind of sucks for them, but that's like, that's the role they were built to play in this whole thing. Very but letters true. are awesome. Yeah, man. I see them as our composers. You know, like they it's and it's the same with film scores, right? Like if you if a film score is fantastic, it is just lifting up what you're seeing on the screen. But if it's bad, if it doesn't match tonally. I mean, that's grounds for walking out of a movie. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, very much the same the same case with the letter. Funnily enough, I don't know if you know this, but um, uh, uh, another mutual of ours that uh, was at that dinner jerome is actually lettering one of the stories in minutes to midnight of course because jerome is lettering everything on kickstarter <laughs> he's great man speaking of great letterers <laughs> shout out to jerome fantastic talent jerome's a good dude i mean he's a canadian doesn't like tim horton so i don't understand like where he how he is uh, alive but <laughs> he's a good dude no uh, all jokes aside i, I love jerome i Dude, so something I've I'm always curious with with writers because I've seen so many different ways of doing this, and we can stick with uh, Area Fifty One for this because I think the question fits that book better. When you're writing that, do you are you an issue by issue guy, or did you sit down and write the entire series in one shot and then send it out? I had an outline, um, but I don't really believe in being a slave to the outline. You know, I. I would consider myself like uh, there's a, a really, really great live talk with George R. R. Martin where he talks about the two types of writers. There are architects and there are gardeners. The architects are the people that know everything way before it happens. You know, they have these these incredibly dense and detailed schematics of the world, the characters, the app, the, the, the setting, the politics of their world, you know, and um, I am not that. Um, my outlines up until this point have kind of been – Here's thematically what we're pulling for. Here are little snippets of moments that have kind of been filtered through my head that I want to try and and maybe lines of dialogue and, and I'll have like a rough a rough plot of where I want to go. But I really, you know, throughout writing the the Helix project, I really came to understand that my process relies upon having a a skeleton and 
allowing the story to fill in the flesh and the musculature on its own. You know, those characters informed me of what they needed um, throughout the course of that story. And while, you know, the ending that we we ended up going with is still incredibly similar to what we wanted to do, the way we delivered it, the way we executed the the journey to that point has changed quite a lot. Um, and I think there's a really, really important moment as a writer where you have to let the characters take on a life of their own. They exist beyond you. It's not about what you want for them. It's about what the character needs. And what the character needs is not always going to be pleasant. Um, but you you have to listen to them. And um, I think that's that's probably the most important step is learning to listen to these characters that you've made beyond yourself. Yeah. I like the way you put it. I always say when I'm thinking of stories that I'm uh, creating, I, I think in scenes. So like out, usually a story is branched out of like, I'm just at work or something and doing something mundane. And I just, I see the scene in my head and I'm like, that's really cool. And then I, I kind of build off that. And then nine times out of 10, that scene doesn't happen because like you said, characters take their own path and they do their own thing and you can't get to that moment, at least in the way that you planned. So I, I like the gardener uh, approach to that. It, it It's a cool way of putting it. Yeah, man, I, I that's, you know, and, and I'm sure for the like sometime in the future, I, I might have stints where I feel more architectural about it. You know, um, usually, you know, my stories start with theme and I think about what, what is the, how can I best amplify this very human question or notion that I'm wrestling with, mm -hmm. you know, like the Helix project was about me wrestling with who I was in yeah. the face of a world that was telling me who to be and how to be it. Right. Because there's, there was a societal perception, I think, um, that, you know, if I were to be a doctor, that would be prestigious and safe and, and what have you. And certainly I, I was incredibly nervous <laughs> when, when, uh, sort of, it would have, the, the news trickled out to my family that I was no longer going to be pursuing a PhD and I was going to write comics instead, um, to a degree, rightfully so. I mean, it's, it's, it's very, uh, un in, it's an insecure financial situation to put yourself in, but um, you know that's where that story came from. And, and you know, moving further, you know, I start I started with an idea for minutes to midnight. Like as a young person, I felt like um, I was growing up in a world that totally lacked perspective, even though there are more perspectives out there than ever before by virtue of large populations and our ability to um, communicate on a global and instantaneous level. And so, you know usually as like a, it's it's me wrestling with an idea and thinking how how can i best explore those ideas through genre um and and we just kind of move from there and i th and i think you just did the segue for me there so the new book uh currently running on kickstarter everybody so uh you're gonna go check that out once you're done listening to this is minutes to midnight the hour between life and death so maybe uh, start with a quick elevator pitch there. What's this book about? So Minutes to Midnight is a collection of four genre short stories, all um, all sort of playing around with this theme of perspective. You know, I uh, my little independent publishing label is called Pocket Watch Press. And so I really wanted to play with a theme to me that resonates with uh, a time of day. And the first and, and most seamless uh, start for that for me was Midnight you know, the end of the old day, the beginning of a new, and this idea that you can choose to carry with you what you want into the new day. And sometimes those things are, um, those things can be depreciating assets, you know, they can uh, end up being diminutive, or you can choose to gain a new perspective and grow. And so we have four genre short stories that explore the theme of perspective from different angles. So we have um, the main story in the project, which is reteaming myself and Samuel Iwunze from the end of the Helix project, um, which is a, a grim and moody thriller uh, uh, featuring Carlos Mancebo, who is a grizzled detective as he investigates a string of suicides 
linked to addresses from a stretch of land involved in a failed eminent domain seizure attempt. Um, what he discovers ends up triggering these drug-laden flashbacks that lead him into the gullet of this saw-like murder case that puts his long-dead, drug-addled marriage into question. And so Carlos's story ends up spiraling into uh, one of uh, of perception and control and addiction. So it's very cerebral. Um, on an artistic level, uh, Sam and I are going very experimental. I mean, we are really pushing our understanding of the form of the comic book page and playing with how we use that in an atmospheric sense to sell, to tell the story. And that's actually the story that our, uh, our buddy Jerome is lettering. Very nice. Yeah. It's so you were uh, nice enough to send me some preview pages of it to kind of look over the book. And I mean, right off the bat, just like with uh, area 51, the first thing that popped out to me was the art. Uh, it kept that high bar and I, I honestly, it was, I, I almost hate saying this cause I don't, I don't want to sound like I'm being mean to other Kickstarters or the creators on Kickstarter, but there was just a different level where I didn't believe really it was a Kickstarter book. And, uh, yeah, that was just the first thing that popped up to me. So it makes sense that, uh, some of the creators you worked with in the past run as well, but I did want to just pull out this tweet you had, I believe it was earlier today talking about the book. It was actually yesterday, which to everybody, this was over a week ago. So, uh, a drug induced detective thriller, a supernatural coming of age, a Dante esque historical fantasy and an interpersonal drama set in the future. These four stories all with just awesome genre descriptions added to them, which I just loved. Thanks, man. Yeah, I, I really, like I said, I see genre as a tool to amplify elements of theme and of character. You know, um, when I when I wanted to tell a story about perception and control, um, I thought about this idea of a detective who, uh, you know, I mean, the, the name of that story being Reflections and Other Little Devils, this idea that like the way that you look at yourself changes your understanding of not only you as a singular you know entity but of the world around you and so i felt like that was really interesting because detective stories are all about perception right the way mm -hmm. that that the 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 uh, lead character is interpreting the crime that they are solving and how that plays into the overall theme you know and then you have um that supernatural coming of age story which is beautifully colored by uh, Steph C, who uh, is, a, is an incredibly talented Mexican artist who uh, layers watercolor with colored pencil and creates this, this Pixar-esque, hyper-emotive, uh, character-packed um, artwork. And this story, what's really cool about that one is it's the only one of these four that I plan to syndicate in every one of my annual collections. Cause I want to follow this character as he comes of age. And it's, it's kind of a, it's a cool play on like King Lear and like Midas, uh, you know, touch everything he touches turns to gold. But this character is actually more of an empath and he has the capacity to either, um, to, to siphon off the emotions of any person he touches, but it is a pendulum because he can siphon off their negative emotions and grant them comfort and happiness and satisfaction, or he can unload his own dissatisfaction and his own sadness onto other people in order to alleviate his own woes. And so um, I really wanted to tell the story, uh, this coming of age story about self-sacrifice and, and self-preservation and the balance between those two things. You know, I, I always, this story you know, is reminds me like it, it comes a lot from my childhood because I was always the type of person who probably gave too much to people. And it, it really put me in a compromised position where I wasn't able to help or be maybe as helpful as I wanted to be because I had given my energy to the wrong people. And there was a period when I was a little bit younger where I noticed that and it made me really bitter. You know, it made me really, really, really bitter. And so I wanted to kind of tell a story about balancing that under the circumstance of being able to to, to do what I was looking to do on a very um, tangible level. Uh, and on all of that is, is just beautifully rendered by Steph, who, 
I mean, her artwork is so vibrant and there's so much vitality and personality, um, which is like, it's unmatched. I don't think I've ever seen an artist with um, her, her approach. Yeah. I, r- real quick to jump in there. It's, I kind of dealt with the same thing when I was younger. And I just want to say to everybody out there, if you're doing that, stop. <laughs> And I say this as somebody who wasted a lot of their life and went through a very dark period. And I think I've discussed in the past uh, the issues I had with depression as a young 20 something and where that almost led. But yeah, everybody out there, don't do that. Um, that aside, I, I love the, the, I love the genres you're, you're dealing with here. Um, but the one thing that stood out to me when I was reading over kind of what you were doing here, a lot of, and I know we're not calling it an anthology, but I'm going to compare it to anthologies. A lot of anthologies like to use genre as the crux to what it is. So it's a sci- it's a space sci-fi anthology. It's a uh, uh, a gay love anthology or something like that. You know, there's there's a th- not really a theme. There's a genre, and with this being a collection of short stories and with you being the one that's doing every, all the writing in the book, what stands out to me is that it's not about a genre. It's about a theme. And I would love to just hear how you, what made you want to do that? Yeah, man, I, I think it, it, it stems back to that philosophy that I had mentioned earlier, that genre is a tool for me to amplify theme. And like, I'm a, I'm a theme and character writer first. You know what I mean? Like, I, um, I, I don't believe in like I, I, as much as I have genres that I think play best to the themes I'm interested in tackling. You know, I love sci-fi. I love th- detective thrillers. I love fantasy. I, um, I, I, I can't really say that I, I, I dislike any particular genre. You know, I, I, like I said, I don't think that that is the basis for story. At least not for me. That's not how I operate. And, um. I don't know, man. I, there was also a part of me going into this that didn't want to be pigeonholed. You know, it it was a little bit untraditional for the first thing. Um, the first work of mine right out the gate being an entire six issue series, you know, the big piece of advice is always do short stories and anthologies and one shots and then like little, you know, five, six pagers, whatever. And I did not follow any of that advice. Where's the Um, fun in that? (laughs) (laughs) And uh, so, you know, there's a part of me that was like, uh, you know, I, I loved the Helix Project and I love the, the space um, of that sort of sci-fi thriller with the espionage-esque element. But um, I don't ever want somebody to look at me and limit their perception of my capabilities based on a genre because I think that's exceedingly small. And uh, I, I wanted to be able to come out here with my sort of sophomore project and and say, no, actually, I can play in whatever sandbox I want to play uh, in, and I can do it well. And so that was definitely part of the, the decision to do something like this. But I think primarily, like I had things I wanted to confront. I wanted to tell a story about self-perception. So I, I have Carlos's story in reflections and other little devils. And I wanted to tell us a, a story about self-preservation and balancing that with self-sacrifice. And, and so that's where we get the marvelous misadventures of the melancholy man, which is probably one of my favorite titles. <laughs> um, in the collection. And then you have something like Time Fleeting War Immortal, which is um, that story evolved so much. I mean, it doubled in size. Like that that story kind of booted another short story out of the collection because I, I wanted to let it be as long as it needed to be. And I think it really paid off. You know, it's it's this – when I say it's like a Dante-esque comedy, you know, it, it really reaches back to the traditional understanding that 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 comedy is tragic in a way. So it's, it's, it's almost like what you would call nowadays a black comedy. Um, and so, you know, that story is, is something I'm really, really exciting, excited to show off, but that comes from this idea that I wanted to tell a story about the frailty of conflict and the limitations of ideals and ideologies based on 
the context of their time you know like that story is is about two nearly immortal warlords who reconvene throughout every great battle in human history from the beginning of time before time was measured to the end of all humanity and it, it's about the again like i said the changing landscape of war the way that adversity is sometimes conditioned and brought upon us uh based on our social structures our governments um our cultures and and of course like ultimately that we will never have enough time. You know, this is a story about two immortal warlords effectively who are wasting their time, choosing to be enthralled in conflict um, and, and just sort of realizing that it wasn't enough. And uh, that, that story I'm really excited because my colorist from the Helix project is actually doing the interiors for that book. He did um, two covers for the Helix project towards the end there. He did the five, the the C cover for five and six, which are gorgeous, um, and uh, he also did the A cover, which you've probably seen in that press kit folder mm-hmm. um, for Minutes to Midnight. But yeah, I, I that story, like I said, just wanted to come from me saying like, hey, these things that we're confronting right now maybe don't matter as much as we think they are, and I think that there is a piece to be made with that, you know. That cover probably used as a thumbnail for this interview, too. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Yeah, and I love that idea because we do as people, as humans, get too involved in these moments that really don't matter. And it's something as I've grown older, I really dealt with where it's something that you, our parents, at least my parents said all the time. And older people always told me like, you know, you gotta just let it go like water off a duck's back mm-hmm. and you would just get so involved in it. And I've kind of realized that's true. Like there's things I can't, there's things I can't uh, control. Things are just going to happen. I have to figure out my way in life to just maneuver these things or deal with them. And that's not everything, everybody. There's stuff that you shouldn't just deal with, but so I love that theme is what I'm saying. Like <laughs> it's just thank you, man. It really yeah. it hits home with uh, somebody who's it's it sounds like we had similar upbringings in terms of the things that we did and how we treated people around us. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, man, you know what like I and I you know I resonate with that too. I uh I held grudges like uh can I swear? Is swearing a thing? Oh yeah, fuck it. I held I held grudges <laughs> like a motherfucker, man. Like and, and that that was something I definitely inherited from my old man. And the grudges that he carries with him, even to this day, um, they bring him down. You know, they they deteriorate his life because he chooses to let them affect him. And so part of the part of like that's part of where that story came from. And the title, um, you know, Time Fleeting War Immortal, that came to me like really, really quickly. Like it's it's to me like that is is just so it's so resonant to the, the concept of the story and to the theme in a big way. Um, and then, you know, like leading into the last story in the anthology, it's called the bear market businessman. And this might be like the most, I don't know. I don't, I wouldn't say it's the best thing I've ever done. I'm very, very proud of it, but just being like completely transparent, I think it's very good. But I think the, the element to it that people are going to love is that it's the most raw. It is the most emotionally raw and honest story I've ever written. Mm -hmm. Um, like I said, it's, I'm marketing it as an interpersonal drama. Like, yeah, it takes place in this, like this, this, this neon adorned New York city, hundreds of years in the future. And sure. Like there are like sci-fi elements. Like the first page is a guy like basically sweeping up dust with like a, a machine that creates light constructs, you know, that, that move and, and morph to the, the surface area of whatever it's touching. But like, it's not about that. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's about a man who's overwhelmed the richest man on the planet feeling unfulfilled and um and and frankly overwhelmed by the the flashing lights and the mechanics and the industrialism of the world that we live in and and how it deprives us a little bit of our humanity um because it makes us forget what we are and it makes us forget that we are all connected and and so the bear market businessman um is a little bit of a tongue in cheek title but it it's it's incredibly honest and it's incredibly personal. And uh, that story is just like carried by the artist Ryan Best, who 
like Steph has this very emotive style, but his is his work is very different because he has these really lush, expressive lines that that he's he's very evocative of like a Terry Dodson. Um, and that's, that's one of the reasons why I put him on the project. And he actually, it's funny, funny enough, shout out to Ryan, because I was originally going to bring in, um, another colorist and he was like, I actually really like coloring my work. And I was like, all right, you know what? I'll pay for the first page of colors and we'll see how it goes. And he blew me away. I mean, his colors are so lush and, 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 and thoughtful in terms of the palette and, he uh he just he brought something really really special to that story and a mindfulness for character acting uh that you don't you, we don't talk about enough in comics like character acting in interior comics is one of the most important elements to a good or great dare i say comic book artist because you have to be able to feel the emotion of of the story of the characters the conflict that they're going through and you know i think part of the reason that you have you have like people aren't focusing on it as much as actually the fault of the writers because a lot of writers will overwrite you know they feel the need to fill everything in with millions and millions of captions um but for me like i when i when i won't work with an artist on a project like ryan i want somebody who's going to be able to do a lot of that work visually like in my mind as much as i am like a pretentious writer brain and i want to be floral and poetic and whatever uh, to me, I think the words need to be complementary. You know, the text needs to be complementary to the character acting and to the way the, for lack of better terms, the perspective and the camera is moving throughout the story. And uh, he he killed it. He absolutely killed it in this story. And I think people, I don't know, who knows? Maybe people will cry at the end of that story. <laughs> yeah, I, I think what most people don't think about with comics is the writer is the director. The art team is everything else. Like they're the cinematographer, they're the 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 caster, they're the makeup, they're they do everything else. <laughs> so I always I always think of when I'm uh, making something and I'm very junior in my work, but I don't con even consider myself a writer because a lot of times, like you said, I don't like when I see scripts that are overwritten. And mm -hmm. I, I think I've literally put in a script like this needs to happen. I need to get to this, do something cool because usually the <laughs> artist has something cool in mind and can do and can come back with like, holy shit, that was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and I like that collaborative aspect of comics where the artist should have some say in the story. Like it's he spends all this time drawing it. Why not let them go? Yeah, and and you know, I mean, I'm I'm a very hands-on writer. Like my scripts are are pretty detailed, but there there has to be a level of ego that you let go, and 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 you have to do that by trusting your instincts in your collaborators. Like you are like as an indie guy, like it's not like the big two where an editor hands you collaborators on a plate and you have to figure it out. You're staffing your team, and. If I'm bringing someone onto the project, not only do I have to like their aesthetic and their style, I have to trust their intuition. You know, that's a huge, um, th that's arguably the most important part of picking a collaborator is, is having trust in their storytelling ability. And so despite being descriptive, you know, there have been times where artists hand me roughs or they'll send me an email saying, I see what you're going for. I don't know if that quite accomplishes what you're looking to accomplish. Here's my thoughts. And nine out of 10 times, that's what we we go to. I mean, Ryan, just to pick on him some more, Ryan had a couple of instances, actually quite a few in that story where um, he had moved the the way we were shooting certain panels, camera angles, and and less the shot size, but certainly some, some situations there. And I think out of maybe the seven or eight uh, uh, panels that he adjusted. There was only one that I I felt like I needed to explain and discuss and and talk about um, and and put up a little bit of an opposition to. But like that's what you want. Like you are hiring an artist not only because you like their style, but because you you have you have to trust that they are they are more fluent in the visual language of, of comic book storytelling than you are. I mean, I, I have a lot of faith in myself. I have a lot of faith in my, my vision, but 
I'm hiring them because they contribute something that I can't possibly contribute. And so you have to be able to acknowledge that you have to trust your, your instinct, um, when you decided to bring them on. And, uh, you know, I, I trust that instinct probably more than I trust anything else, uh, in my tool set when it comes to making comics, because, I mean, I've been, I've been very, very privileged to work with some incredibly talented people. And that's probably one of the things, if not the thing that I am most proud of is that I've been able to work and, and, and kind of seek out people that take me to an entire new level. You know, they make me want to be better. They, they make me a better writer. And so, um, that's, that's really, really important for me. Yeah. And, and a kudos to you for, you've been able to spout off members of your creative team one after another without any hesitation. So kudos to you for doing that and for throwing them in with this because uh, not enough creators do that. Dude. I mean, they, you know, I don't, I don't make these stories without them. And also I, I realized I missed someone speaking of, uh, we have the, uh, again, another ubiquitous letter in comics, Micah Myers, uh, who, is lettering the marvelous misadventures of the melancholy man. I want to make sure I didn't leave him out as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, those are I, the only two letters and comics just so everyone knows. <laughs> the only two. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's how it works. <laughs> um, but you know, man, it's like they are the comics are a visual medium. Like, you know, I don't believe in the marketing device of insert writer's name here, apostrophe S, and then the title of the book. I don't believe in that because it's not just mine. Like I, uh, they are vital to these stories. These stories don't exist in the form that they do without uh, the artists and the other members of the sort of auxiliary art team. And so, yeah, man, I think it's incredibly important, especially in, in a project like this where we have four stories with four incredibly different artistic signatures on them and part of what makes a major part of what makes them so special and so different from one another is the art you know the art teams and and what they're bringing to the project so yeah shout out to everybody um who who just brought their a game to to this project i'm incredibly grateful yeah and uh, as you said like it's not just yours and what I found to be the proof of that is like you could give the same script, the same story to a hundred different artists, and you'll get a hundred different books. And I thought actually Marvel of all publishers proved this really well with a they've done it a few times, but being a Captain America fan, I picked up the Captain America number one redo where a different artist did every page, um, redid it from the original issue. Wow. And that just kind of shows you as you're reading through it being someone who's read those old comics and then reading this, just how different the art styles for each person affects that page and the story that's being told, even if it's subtle, it just, it completely changes that page. So uh, I don't know if Marvel still uh, prints it or not, but that's something everybody should check out if they're interested in that process. Absolutely, Um, man. So, I've had you here for a while, but I do got a few more I want to get out. Um, every yeah. creator's favorite question as they're in the middle of a project, not necessarily what's next, but minutes to midnight. Is this a, a series you see doing or is is this one and then like the next thing will be something different? Yeah. So the next thing uh, will be the next uh, sort of collection will be different. Uh, I'd like to do one a year. Um and so this next one, I kind of want to go linearly. And so this next one would be based around uh, like one o'clock in the morning. And I don't really have a title for it yet. Um, but the theme I want to think about is is that's this. It's kind of like silver linings, you know, like you're you're deep into the night. You're kind of thinking about what is to come and, and what the the possibilities are of the new day. And so that's kind of very much in the early development stages. Um, you know, in that, you know, the only thing I can confirm at this point is that we'll be doing a a second chapter for the marvelous misadventures of the melancholy man, um, where we pick up with Midas a couple years later in his, uh, adolescence, um, as opposed to his sort of younger childhood. So that'll be really, really interesting, um, to explore. But 
aside from that, n- nothing super concrete. Um, beyond Minutes to Midnight, I do have a much larger project coming down the pipeline um, where I will be reteaming with Sam again, um, which we actually, there's a little Easter egg for it in issue four of the Helix Project. Uh, the title is actually announced in that book. Uh, so it's something to look out for, but it's a, as of right now, it's a 12 issue series that I'll be bringing to Kickstarter. Um, that is a sort of supernatural historical thriller, which I'm very, very excited. So I don't really like cross pitching. Um, but if I were to describe elements of it, it's, it's like inception meets paradise lost meets the Illuminati. Okay. Yeah. You went a little bit deeper than I thought you would, uh, but thank you. I, <laughs> Yeah, because I'm always curious with these. It's uh, like I keep telling myself, Chris, it's not an anthology; it's a collection of short stories. But I'm always curious with these. Like, yeah, do you do minutes to midnight number two or not? And it sounds like no, you're going to do minutes to one a.m. or you know whatever you end up calling it. But which is its own kind of interesting way to do to do this. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I mean, it could, and it could be an absolutely awful business decision because I'm not like building a singular brand around one title, but, um, here we are. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Maybe we'll call it minutes from midnight. Who knows? <laughs> it's, I've always felt that, uh, when creating something, whether it's something as, like this podcast or, you know, a comic or whatever your, your creative outlet is. Uh, if you do something that you want to have out in the world, something that you want to consume, there's gotta be someone else out there that wants it. So that's the key to success. Mm. And, uh, maybe I'm the wrong person to ask that cause, uh, I'm waiting on the success, but nonetheless, <laughs> I feel like that is the key. So creating stuff that you want and that you want to see out in the world, I think is the way to that. So while it may not make business sense today, I do think at some point you could come back to this book as a turning point or one of these anthology books as a turning point of something. Yeah. I mean, I'd be lying if I didn't admit that um, one of the stories in the collection, I think um, has legs to be something Mm -hmm. a little bit bigger. Uh, But we will save the conversation around that for a, a, a date slightly uh, further into the future. Oh, you almost said it, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, uh, I guess we'll kind of wrap it up with we've talked a lot about the book. We haven't talked a lot about the campaign. So as we're discussing this, uh, just to be honest with the audience, the, the campaign's not live yet, but by the time you're all listening to this, the campaign is live. So what can people expect when they go to the page? Are you what are you offering for tiers? Um sure. so on. Yeah, yeah. So um the name of the game for me has always been I, I want to be affordable in the Kickstarter space compared to a lot of my peers. I think um some of the prices that are being asked are are basically asking um asking backers to foot the bill for them. And I don't, I don't really believe in that. Um, I want to deliver value as best as I can given the circumstances. And so, you know, as you could see, like, I think you were able to pick up the six issues of the Helix project for like what, 40 bucks. And they're all premium, you know, high quality printed issues uh, with anywhere from 24 to 32 pages. And so that is very much the name of the game for me. And so we have, um, you can get a digital copy of the 64 page book. I think it's like $10 or something like that. Um, and it comes with the cover gallery. You know, you, you actually get digital files of all the covers. Um, we will have for returning backers and for the, uh, the folks that want to get on it ASAP, we will have an early bird tier, uh, where, uh, we have a limited amount of copies of each of the variants and bundles of all the variants at a discounted price. For people that uh, are willing to get in on the ground floor and support the project, but then you know, otherwise you can grab the book for for like twenty twenty two dollars, something like that. Uh, it's sixty four pages story. We'll probably have some behind the scenes features as well. And um, you know, we have we're going to have three variant covers for the project. The A cover, which you have seen, uh, is done by Marcio Freddi, 
who was the colorist of the Helix Project, secret variant cover artist for the Helix Project, and uh, the interior artist to Time Fleeting War Immortal. We're going to have a cover by Samuel Iwunze, which is haunting. Like, that is the only way I could describe Sam's cover. Um, and then we we actually, this is the first time I've actually talked about it on a podcast, but uh, we have Kane and White joining us for an absolutely glorious C cover that I'm super, super stoked to show you guys. So, um, you know, we, we, I've always prided myself on, on the covers, you know, for these books yeah. and not only that they are graphically just beautiful pieces of work, but also that they are, they're incredibly narrative. They all speak to elements of the story that you are going to find inside, or in this case, the stories plural. And so, um, I'm very, very stoked to to offer those. But returning from previous campaigns, uh, some of the things we offer are the ability to become an official producer of the project. Uh, you get exclusive merchandise that it will never be offered ever again and is not offered to anybody but the producers. Um, you will be given, like I said, a credit inside the book as a producer, as an executive producer, depending on what tier you contribute to. Like the executive producer tiers, for example, have the ability to get a commission from one of, um, from, I think we have three of our artists uh, opening up commission slots for people as well. Um, there is, I think there'll be two options to get drawn into a project. There will be one to get drawn into Minutes to Midnight, and that will be super limited. That'll probably only be live the first week of the campaign because I want to get this book out. And then we will also have another one to get drawn into my next project, which uh, we haven't quite announced yet, but you'll you'll at least uh, hear about the title uh, when it comes to this next campaign. And so, um, yeah, we, a lot of re really, really cool options. I mean, if you go throughout the history of the Helix Project, you've had people get drawn in as uh, soldiers and murder victims and hippies. And so I think it's really cool to be able to immortalize yourself into a comic, particularly, um, you know, giving my guys credit. They're incredible. Like they're incredible artists. So you're going to be able to see yourself in uh, all of your glory and well rendered. So I think that's exciting. Um, and, and, you know, I think one of the unique options that I offer are that uh, for fledgling comic book creators, I will, will also be offering like portfolio reviews for writers and artists. And um, as you can tell, I, I'm probably over, overly verbose, but when it comes to my reviews, I think it means that you'll be getting somebody that's going to be giving you um, a thoughtful critique, thoughtful feedback about your work. And uh, they're, they're all private. So um, in addition to that, you know, before that tier, you'll be getting copies of the books. You'll be getting digital copies of both the Helix project and minutes to midnight. Um, you know, so I think, I think that's pretty unique. And, uh, you know, you'll have, uh, various bundles if you want to catch up and grab a little bit of everything. So whether you want to snag all three variants of minutes to midnight, or if you want one copy of everything I have ever made, you know, there are bundles for that to incentivize, uh, the ultimate collector. And so we have like the, uh, I think the, I love comics pack, which gives you, what is it? Let's see. So you get digital copies of both books early access to uh, minutes to midnight digitally you get let's see scrolling through it now here you get one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen helix project covers <laughs> uh, along with uh, all three covers of minutes to midnight at a at a really really solid discounted rate so you know, we'll be updating things a little bit um, as we get closer and closer to the campaign because that's just how these Kickstarters work. It's frantic and last minute and what have you. But uh, yeah, um, you know, I think there's a lot of value to be had. I'll say before I go into my next question, uh, just to clarify with everybody, uh, all six issues of Helix Project was 50 bucks. That's was shipping. And like you said, 32 pages, nice printing and everything. To compare it to some others, because I did remember your prices were very low, at least in my opinion. But I just got some others, one issue books here, $14, $21. These are ones I've pledged to, $12. Wow. Mind you, this is all with shipping, but I mean, uh, still. Dang, the, I, the cheaper I, one's like ten dollars, and this is for one issue shipped. 
Um, so yeah, I, I think your at least your past project was very affordable, and it's one of the things I noticed right away that I thought was nice. And you know, we I do my best to to not deprive people of that premium reader experience despite being affordable. You know, the print quality is some of the best in the industry. I mean, for example, that that sixth issue of the Helix Project, you'll notice once you open them up, that's actually cardstock. I didn't charge anything extra for a 32 page oh, wow. cardstock book. And the A cover is actually a wraparound cover, you know? So for me, like delivering more value, you know, than what you paid for is, is really important because I think whether it's the big two or respectfully uh, other folks on Kickstarter, um, the readers end up having to foot a pretty crazy bill for sometimes comparably little value. And so while I am, trying to run a business and well, I do need to make money. It's important for me as somebody who is still a consumer of comics to make people feel like they might've walked away with a little bit more than what they paid for. Um, then I, I think that speaks a lot to where the industry is now, but, uh, I, I, I try not to forget that not only did I start my love of comics as a consumer, I am one now. Um, so that's, that's sort of the thinking that leads the, the uh, price points for these books under promise over deliver. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Absolutely. So I'm, I'm so excited. I'm so excited for people <laughs> to read this book, for people to check it out. It's, it's, it's experimental and it's out there. And I think in my humble opinion, it puts on display everything and more that I learned from the Helix project. And um, again, like I can't say enough great things about the art team that, that uh, have been assembled for this project. They um, have taught me so much just by way of collaboration. And, you know, it, it, it actually makes me even more excited for things moving forward because I feel like the tools that I was able to pick up on throughout the course of making this series will only make everything I do in the future even better. So very, very excited. And, and I, I, man, thank you so much for, um, sharing your platform with me to talk about mm -hmm. such a personal project. It means a lot. And it's something that I definitely don't take for granted. Oh, no problem, man. I do. I just got one more question for you and then I'm going to let you go. Cause you've been so generous with your time. Sure. Um, cause I find this interesting with Kickstarter people of how they treat this stretch goals. <laughs> Have you thought ahead of time what stretch goals are? Or are you the kind of guy that's like, uh, if we fund, I'll think about it then. <laughs> um, I did think about stretch goals. I am kind of pivoting because to be honest, I had a really good chat with um, two two industry buddies of mine, uh, Pat Shand and Richard Fairgray last night. And um, they kind of talked me out of a stretch goal um, for, for wait, good wait, reason. Richard Fairgray? Talk yeah. you out of one. I need to know what the stretch goal is now. <laughs> oh, I, I, I could. I'll tell you off recording for sure. Um, but they talked me out of a particular stretch goal, which which it not that it will be going away in its entirety. It will that will see the light of day in a different form sometime in the future. Um, but they made they made really really good points. Um, so I think one of the things that that we'll be offering is obviously you will always have the option to potentially unlock a brand new cover. Um, I've got two really, really talented artists kind of working away on some potential cover art for that. Uh, one of which is, uh, Fraser Irving, who is, is a phenomenal, uh, cover artist out of the UK. And then we have Mark Aspinall who might be contributing something to the project. We're still sort of having conversations, but there will be potentially an option. Um, I think around nine K to unlock a, a fourth variant cover. And then, um, Man, that's so. the The whole having to shift my my thinking uh, based on the conversation the conversation I had last night um, definitely threw me a little bit for a loop because that was one of the bigger uh, stretch goals for the project. Um, the ones one of the ones that I thought was going to get the most traction. But um, it's fine if you don't want to announce the stretch goals right now. I I just I'm always curious how creators treat stretch goals because I I meet some a lot now actually who are just like. <laughs> man, I just want to fund. Like when, once we get there, I'll worry about that shit then. <laughs> yeah. So if, I'm, yeah. If, if I'm honest, I don't know if it's, 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 um, <laughs> overconfidence, but I don't, I don't worry about hitting our base goal anymore. Like mm -hmm. I, I, I think we've built up such a, a passionate and, 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 and kind audience of people, um, that 
I would like to think are largely there because they believe in, in the stories that I have to tell, not just in the stories themselves. And so I think that they will show up and I have a lot of faith in that. So um, for me, I, I have no reservations about hitting our stretch goal and may, who knows, maybe I eat my words. Maybe this is the worst campaign I've ever had, but um, you know, for me, it is, it is about kind of taking those next steps to making the project more profitable because that means that, you know, that's, that's all the more money that I can funnel into future comics and the next big thing that I create. And it allows me to take bigger swings like this one, right? Like the only reason this had the turnaround time that it did is because, you know, everybody showed up for the Helix Project 6. You know what I mean? Like then I'm working with, with four sets of artists instead of one consistent creative team, which is costly. You know, I'm producing a 64 page book out of pocket before it comes out, before I'm getting reimbursed. And that was only because people showed up. And so I think to a degree, you know, the audience knows that the, the, the better that this project does, the bigger swing I'll be able to take on the next project. And it, to a degree, I think it's it's kind of like an angel investment. Like if if we do really well on this one, that means that I'll be able to to do something even bigger, even crazier, even more worthwhile. My next swing at bat, and uh, you know, the goal is to do our best to hit a home run every single time. Awesome, awesome. Well, I am confident that you also hit that goal, so don't worry about it. <laughs> but uh, so, like I said, you've been very generous with time, so I do want to get you uh, you moving along. <laughs> Uh, before you go, though, where can people find you online? What's your social media poison of choice? Uh, <laughs> any any of the things you want to pimp out? Yeah, man. Um, so you can find me on Facebook or on Instagram at Pocket Watch Press. That's the name of my uh, publishing company. I do run those accounts. Um, <laughs> and I'm not the most consistent, <laughs> but um, you know they're there, and I will see your comments and your messages when they come up. Uh, I would say I'm most active on Twitter which you can find me at P watch press uh, shout out character limitations. Thanks Elon. But um, yeah, I, I would say I'm the most active on Twitter nowadays. That's kind of where I've built up more of my sort of social group. So you'll find little teases there. I also have a newsletter that I would recommend people check out uh, whether it's just to keep up to date with everything I'm doing, or, you know, if you want early behind the scenes, look, looks at some of my art, um, and some of the future projects before they ever see the light of day. We also run giveaways, uh, basically three times a year. And then, um, uh, you know, if you're an aspiring creator, I think it's a useful tool because I I'll do these features every now and again, where I walk through a page from start to finish. So like, we'll take every step from that, that original script and even throughout like the email correspondence between me and the artists, you know, the notes that affect the way the page comes out. Cause I think that's something that you don't see often, but it's, it's so vital to the process. Um, very rarely, not very rarely, less often than people would think, does the page come out exactly as the, the script originally has it. Um, and very right. rarely, you know, do, do things go on a, a linear path in that way. So that'll be there. Um, I believe, so I just switched over to, um, Substack. I think I forget. I think it's what Pocket Watch Press dot Substack dot com. I think it's dot com. Yeah, I'm I don't use Substack to... enough. <laughs> yeah, no. Well, I just got into it because Mailchimp yeah. decided to uh, tighten the noose on uh, what they offer for the. Uh, non-paid subscription and their paid subscriptions are outrageous. So it is pocketwatchpress.substack.com. You can sign up there. I release newsletters every two weeks or so. Uh, and you'll also see announcements for um, convention appearances. So if you want to come and meet me, you want me to scribble my name on your comics, you want to tell me how bad I am at making comics, that's how you know. And I'm, I, I stay pretty mobile. You know, I think we're what? We're in May. I've done one, two, three, four, four shows this year already. Um, I'll be in Charlotte at Heroes Con in June, Terrific Con in July, Fan Expo Canada in August, uh, Memphis Comic Expo and Baltimore Comic Con in September, New York in October, and um, uh, very, very privileged to be um, uh, a guest at uh, Thought Bubble in 
in the UK in November. So uh, a, a lot going on. So yeah, uh, you want me to vandalize your books or you want to tell me that uh, my comics aren't as good as I think they are, then uh, that's where you can find me. I'm jealous of that Thought Bubble one. I want to go to that show so bad. I, uh, dude, let me tell you a little, little like inside baseball. Um, so I, I did Wicked, Wicked Comic Con in Boston. I came mm-hmm. home. I had one day to get all my logistical stuff sort of out of the way and to pack and to re up my inventory before I was on a plane to go to Calgary in Canada uh, for the Calgary Expo. And that night, um, I had seen Richard post something about, oh, he's like, I'm going to Thought Bubble. And I was like, oh, I wonder if I got an email back. And so uh, it wasn't in my my primary um, inbox. It was in my spam. And I saw an email that says, you know, news of your Thought Bubble invitation. And I was like, oh, it's going to be a denial. And it was, it was I, I swear to God, man, it was two in the morning. And I was packing suitcases with with books to bring to Calgary. And I opened the email and and it just says like, congratulations. You know, and and the first thing I did was call Richard and go, dude, you won't freaking believe this. So <laughs> I'm I'm so 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 excited to go to that show. Um, it it's it's a it feels like such a big step. Definitely. So everybody out there, as always, you know, you'll find a lot of those links, if not all those links, in the show notes down below. So make sure to click on them. Most importantly, click on the <laughs> Kickstarter link because. Yeah, that's the one that we're uh, we're talking about today, and that's the book that I'm really excited for. I'm going to be there day one, so I th- hope all of you will be there uh, alongside with me. So, uh, Trevor, thanks so much for taking so much time to come and talk to me. I appreciate you stopping by, and uh, we'll definitely have to do this again sometime. Dude, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Thank you for um, you know opening up the floor to such a great conversation, and uh, I look forward to you know the next time. You know, we can share a drink and a pizza in person. Um, maybe not the mellow mushroom again, but uh, certainly uh, good times will roll. It might be sooner than you think. <laughs> Hell yeah.